Can a memo really change the world? UNFTR. I don't know. Common Sense by Thomas Paine was just a pamphlet, but it inspired a revolution. George Kennan's long telegram influenced generations of foreign policy thinking. It's probably too much to suggest that these pamphlets or memos change the world, but it's not too much to suggest that sometimes they capture the zeitgeist and become the fulcrum of new thinking. Following up on our 70s Changed Everything video, we're talking about the now infamous Powell Memo and the influence that it had on corporate America, and ultimately the neoliberal movement. As I mentioned in the prior video, corporate America was keen to remove a thorn from its side. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader. While Lewis Powell, the author of the memo, was just a lawyer at the time, he was offended by the likes of Nader and what he and others viewed as an all-out assault on the business community. Lewis Powell Jr. was a high-profile attorney who directed his memo to the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in 1971. He was all hot and bothered by the attack on the private sector, a fierce critic of socialism, and as I said, he hated Ralph Nader. In the memo, he pushed the chamber to gather political power and weaponize it against the Naders of the world. He begins the memo to the chamber by speaking to the multitude of threats to the United States, saying, quote, What now concerns us is quite new in the history of America. We're not dealing with sporadic or isolated attacks from a relatively few extremists or even from the minority socialist cadre. Rather, the assault on the enterprise system is broadly based and consistently pursued. It is gaining momentum and converts. He goes on to attack Nader, famed civil rights attorney William Kunstler, the corporate media, universities, socialists, communists, new leftists, artists, scientists, and politicians. Powell criticized the business community as a whole for responding, quote, by appeasement, ineptitude, and ignoring the problem. Powell's recipe was to first create a position called executive vice president and to build a public relations team that reports to him. Yes, him. He then calls upon the Chamber of Commerce to coordinate lobbying and PR efforts so that no one corporation is left out in the cold fighting the commies. His true innovation that ignited a flame among the wealthy libertarian set was to create a stealth attack on college campuses by packing social sciences with business-friendly professors, rewriting textbooks, and paying for speakers to present corporate ideas at campus events. He then lays out an all-out assault on the public consciousness through advertising, demanding equal time on news programs for corporate chills, and flooding the market with books, pamphlets, and scholarly articles sponsored by the chamber. Powell doesn't end there. He also advocates for grooming business-friendly justices, which will hit closer to home for him than he even imagined, taking over boardrooms through shareholder activism, cultivating power in political circles, i.e. buying off politicians. What makes the Powell memo so powerful in hindsight is the fact that literally everything he prescribed came to fruition. Powell's plan of attack is almost haunting in its efficiency and accuracy. Over the next few years, the wealthy libertarian strain of the conservative movement, led by Charles and David Koch, among others, would use this outline as a blueprint for hijacking the American political process. And perhaps it would have found its way into obscurity if the author himself didn't go on to embody the vision of his memorandum for the rest of his life. Okay, so Powell himself was a cranky old corporate lawyer whose clients were likely impacted by government regulations. And maybe the memo wouldn't be such a big deal if Powell wasn't shortly thereafter appointed to the Supreme Court, a position that even he thought he was purportedly not qualified to fill. Rather quaint considering some of our recent appointments. But I digress. Lewis Powell was never a judge prior to his appointment by Nixon. He'd never argued a case in front of the Supreme Court. But he was a board member of Philip Morris and represented the Tobacco Institute. So for anyone who thinks that unqualified justices with conflicts of interest are a new thing, here you go. Much like his successor, Justice Anthony Kennedy, Powell was often in the middle of some prominent issues. Now in fairness, he had some liberal decisions and opinions on social issues. And then again, some not so enlightened stances on issues surrounding sexuality. But on business issues, he was resolutely on the side of corporations. The most significant of cases for which Powell broke the tie and wrote the majority opinion was the First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti, which applied the logic of the First Amendment to corporate financial contributions. If this sounds familiar, it should. This decision was one of the precedents the court relied upon for the Citizens United decision. 
He also wrote the majority opinion for a case called San Antonio v. Rodriguez, which marked the end of progress in education reform and integration of the schools. Basically, Powell threw in with the states' rights argument that gave discretion to states to fund schools as they saw fit, rather than equitably. Now, as a justice, Powell had the remarkable and rather unique experience of being able to put his beliefs into action, or settled law. He was also part of the crew that helped shift the balance of the court in a more conservative direction for a number of years, coming in with the likes of William Rehnquist. But it's interesting, after all of these years, he's more remembered as the author of the eponymous memo and more of a footnote in legal history. If there's anything to glean from this, it's that words have meaning and timing matters. The Chicago school economists were just getting warmed up with their ideas of beating back government intervention in all areas of the economy. Society seemed to be crumbling as the decade kicked off with events like the Kent State shootings and the women's general strike for equality. I mean, counterculture movements were spreading across the country. It was the height of the black power movement, women's liberation, anti-war demonstrations. The establishment was being threatened from all sides and Powell was one of the first to suggest that a concerted movement to right the ship was required to rewrite public education rules, fund law schools, and to develop conservative lawyers and justices and to leverage the financial prowess of the business community. As I've said before, in hindsight, things seem pretty obvious and even simple. But to conservatives at the time, this was groundbreaking and galvanizing. So no, a memo probably can't change the world. But sometimes, publications like this spark a rallying cry because it states clearly what others are thinking. Like in the case of common sense, it can become a rallying cry for freedom from tyranny. Or in the case of the Powell memo, it can become tyranny's rallying cry against freedom. Don't forget to like this video and to subscribe to our channel and tell everyone that you know to do the same. To learn more about our full-length podcast where we do much deeper dives into history, economics, and politics, go to unftr.com or check out the links in the description. Here endeth the video.